Um, I'm Salmini, I'm from Oracle. I wanna be, I'll be talking today about some of our findings as we try to benchmark um, RDBM, BMS applications with the Linux stack. Um, this is joint work I did with Tushar Dave, but he couldn't be here because of some visa problems, so I'll be presenting on his behalf. So here's the agenda. I'm gonna start off by first describing the problem space. Um, this is the backdrop in which we are trying to improve network performance, and that backdrop has a lot of um, non-networking stuff, uh, things around database transforms, things, uh, th other services that are not directly related to the uh, specific flows that we are trying to focus our performance on. And whatever solution we consider has to not cause any damage to those other things, especially the database applications, they are extremely uh, CPU bound, so uh, CPU, uh, util CPU utilization will keep coming up as I go through my talk. So because of these constraints, we had to discard certain solutions. So I'll talk about some of the possible solutions we considered and why we had to discard them, mostly so that we can have those lessons learned as a takeaway. Um, at the moment, we are using UDP and RDS TCP as our IPC transports. We are also looking at using PF packets, so I will talk about the sort of benchmarking we're doing. Um, the micro benchmarks we use include NetPerf uh, and other things that we are all familiar with. We also, in Oracle, have our own IPC library. This is a shim between the database application and the native operating system, IOCOS. So I'll talk about what that library is and how I'm trying to convert it to use PF packet. And that library has its own microbenchmarks and a full-blown test suite that actually simulates a real database. And I'll, talk, I'll show some interesting numbers from that. So this is all work in progress, and um, we have some findings that have generated some ideas that we I would like to talk and discuss with this community, and also um, next steps, things, other things that we could possibly try. So let's start off by looking at the problem space. So there are two types of use cases which for where we really care about reducing network latency. One is for cluster applications. These, this is basically a distributed computing problem. We have a service that is uh, provided in the cluster as a distributed application, and that service is usually CPU bound, so any reduction in network latency, any reduction in uh, network CPU utilization is extremely precious to these applications. Um, these are usually stateless, uh, unconnected UDP flows, and you can identify them with a four tuple. That somewhat simplifies the problem a bit in the sense that if it's a UDP flow, you can do a lot of stuff in user space. If it's a four tuple, you can tweak things for that four tuple, but there is also a risk that you get carried away and tweak things for your four tuple and uh, jeopardize something else. So I'll talk about that as well. Uh, these are transaction based, so that's request response, but the most interesting thing is actually the packet sizes. So for the flows that we care about improving performance about, the request size is usually 512 bytes, the response size is usually 8K bytes. So this is interesting because when we try to improve network performance, we tend to be heavily focused on small packet sizes, which is a hard problem. But at the other end of the spectrum, there's a different set of challenges, and that's what I'd like to uh, talk about today. So this is actually low-hanging fruit for us because it's UDP and it's stateless. The, when we have somewhat conquered this problem, we would like to extend these same ideas for a harder problem set, which is the extract transform load. So in this case, what happens is input comes in in the form of raw data. This could be like JSON or comma separated values. This is things like your employee payroll database of a very large company. And this needs to be converted to a rela relational database format. So this is like what we all studied in our college level class. You have one large set of rows and columns. You do some transform. You convert it to different views, which has the same information, but it's less data to be stored on disk. So Doing that transform is extremely CPU intensive. So you need as much CPU as you can get to do that work. But at the same time, your network input is coming in at a very high rate from a trading application or something similar. So you have to balance between CPU for doing the backend processing and the backend for the uh, network input. And what makes this problem even more complicated is that this is usually TCP. So TCP is extremely stateful. If you try to bypass the kernel TCP stack, you better know what you're doing because the kernel TCP has 30 years of smarts into it, and it's hard to get that right in user space again. So this is the uh, more challenging problem. We want to conquer the UDP flows for the cluster applications first, but 
if you want more information about the ETL problem, there's a pointer in there to give you that information. So let's look at what we are using for our benchmarking right now, which is uh, a distributed lock manager provided by the cluster. So here, essentially, the uh, serve service is actually a set of processes in the cluster, which is the distributed lock manager. What happens is a client comes in and asks for a read-only lock over set or a block of data. That client gets assigned by the load balancer to some server. The client to server assignment is based on the actual UDP payload itself. And currently, we have a pretty well-balanced hash. Um, Jesper pointed out that we could use reuse port. That's probably the next level of optimizations. This was all done in, in a world where reuse port was not uniformly available on the platform supported. So reuse port is a possibility, but we have other um, bottlenecks and uh, issues that we have to remove first. So we'd, we'd like to get that out of the way first. So in this model, what happens is the client is blocked until the response comes back. And when the response comes back, the client is not going to send the re next request immediately. It has to process the response itself. That also is CPU intensive. So this is different from the way we tend to do micro benchmarking. It's, ha it's hard to model this with the typical micro benchmarks. Um, so the client input is bursty. However, we know that the actual bottleneck in the system is the server. I'll show graphs which actually shows this. So the latency of the server becomes eventually the bounding uh, limit on what, what the clients see for latency. So we know that there are a few things that you can do to improve the performance of the system on the whole. So one of these is batching, right? And the server-side batching is actually quite easy to achieve, right? It falls out naturally. The server just keeps reading input until it either runs out of buffer or runs out of input, and then it can go off and start processing. The TX side batching is a bit trickier. If you don't get the batching right, if the server sends out a batch of responses, it's going to wake up a batch of clients, and your input just got burstier. So again, the low-hanging fruit over here is the server-side Rx batching, and that's what we are using at the moment, though we're working on the TX batching as well. So what are the known bottlenecks in this environment? So today we are using UDP, and we are using RDS TCP. So each I.O. call is a send message or receive message, so there's some system call overhead there. The other thing we know is the control over the batch size. So as I pointed out for the ETL case, you have some back-end stuff to do, and you have network input to process. So you want to have a good balance of CPU usage between these two. So what happens is when the server runs up in, out of input, it falls back to pole. It gives up the CPU, so you can start doing your back-end stuff. So you want to have um, a good balance between these two things. So the expectation was that the T-Packet V2 and T-Packet V3, especially the V3, would help in these two areas, and the preliminary results indicate that that is indeed the case. So I said that there are some constraints that come to us which uh, made us discard some solutions. So some of these constraints will be not exactly the same view as the things expressed this morning, but this is as it is. So one of the things is, this is all fitting with a framework of a larger framework of all of this relational database stuff. So the input is coming from disk and file system and NFS and so on. So whatever network handle you give us, it has to be something that we can put in a select pole or epole set. Um, it has to be something which supports some type of open read and write routines. It's OK if it's like PF packet and has some additional stuff that needs to be done with each send message and receive message, but the APIs have to be approximately looking like Polyx. And also, in the process of accelerating the latency of specific UDP flows, you cannot regress the latency of NFS and SMTP and ARP and all the other things going on in the system. It must coexist harmoniously with the Linux stack. So with those constraints in mind, here are some of the solutions that would, would not work for us. So DPDK, for example. It was a non-starter because it's not POSIX. It has a radically different threading model. There is no selectable socket. Plus, DPDK and NetMap, both of them, uh, hijack the entire network interface by default. Right? So if you want to also support NFS and all of these other things, you have to do weird things like KNI, or you have to do some SRIOV or host strings. All of these are clumsy. In comparison, PF Packet is a very clean model. It, it, gives you a short, it gives you a fast path, but at the same time, it doesn't let other sockets also get a copy of the packet. So with that in mind, uh, what we are evaluating, a comparative evaluation that we're doing right now is UDP with send message and receive message, which we already have. Then Jamal pointed out to me that if you do receive a message, you can 
have batching on the Rx side at a cost of one system call, so that's also there for, for comparison. And then T packet V2 and T packet V3. So as I said before, T packet V2 and V3 helps to reduce the system calls and helps improve batching. I am deliberately not talking about the shared memory benefits because I'll come to that in one of the slides. So uh, some of those points have already been made today. So the benchmarks I'm using are, right now I have results for the micro benchmarks. We're using NetPerf with all of these things, three things, and we have a comparison. I am in the middle of converting our IPC libraries. We call them IPCLW, IP Clusterware. I'm converting them to also support uh, PF packet. This is work in progress. Then uh, when that is done and I have cleared the IPCLW benchmarks, then we have an internal database test suite called the CR test test suite, which actually runs the IPCLW library and gives us a performance profile. So let's look at the uh, networking micro benchmarks. I'm using a standard NetPerf client. Um, request size is 512. The response size, I am cheating a bit, and I'm using a 1024 response size. I've also used 8K with jumbo frames, but it's all cheating because I'm kind of punting on the fragmentation and reassembly. Um, I'll come back to that in a bit, but on the server side, I'm not using NetServer. I'm using uh, my own implementation, which can switch between the three different types of transport. So that's why I use NetPerf for the minus N arg. Um, I use 64 NetPerf clients for a single net server because that's usually what we see in uh, production. And I am also cheating in the sense that I am using RSS with SDFN, so I'm using hashing based on address and port. This is cheating because it gives me good numbers for micro benchmarks, but in production, I will get UDP packets that are fragmented and don't have the port number in them, so uh, this is not really uh, something I can do in production. So what happens in the server application? Um, for the UDP, I have a simple application. I checked with Rick Jones to make sure this is also what NetServer does. So uh, it sleeps in pole and gets woken up when there's input, and then it does um, a simplistic batching loop. So it keeps spinning in receive from send to until there's nothing to eat and then goes back to pole. The M message version is the same as that. It just does a batch size of 64. The packet M map, um, I'm not using packet fanart for all of these things. I'm just looking at a single server, single uh, thread performance. So T packet V2, I'm using 2048 byte frames um, and just getting basic results. Uh, the T packet V3 has a lot of degrees of freedom. So here you get woken up on a block and you can set things up with different size blocks, different size of frames per block. So Tushar and I played around with this a bit and we found well, the numbers I will report are the ones which give you the best balance between the throughput and the CPU utilization. This is not necessarily the best possible throughput. The best possible throughput came with 100% CPU utilization, so while those are good hero numbers, the actual thing that will probably work for us in practice is to also uh, have some CPU utilization, so I'll talk about that. And again, uh, for the other settings that we did, we had the SDFN setting for uh, RSS. So this is the numbers for just basic micro benchmarking. So you can see that going from UDP to T packet V2, you've almost doubled the throughput. Uh, the last bar in the histogram is for V3. And if I set it up so that uh, I try to get the best possible throughput, it would be the same or better than V2, but we deliberately tweaked it around a bit so that we actually managed to have CPU utilization that was only about 50%. What did we do to get that? So, we had 64 clients for a single server, and we tried a few different types of settings for the number of frames per block. So if you set up 16 frames per block uh, for a single burst of 64 clients, you can fill up four blocks immediately. So the client gets, the application gets woken up, it starts processing one block. When it releases it, there are still three other blocks, so it can keep spinning around. CPU is about 0% idle, you get the best possible throughput. At the other end of the spectrum, if you put 64 frames in one block, uh, you have the burst coming in, application gets woken up, it has to process everything and flush the block and then uh, give the block back to the kernel and the next block gets filled and so on. So the best possible balance is when you have 32 frames per block because then what happens is you have the application processing a block in user space and at the same time the kernel is filling in the next block. Right? So that gave me about, in this, in this experiment, it gave me about 35% idle for the CPU. And if you try, so if you, it's always one half. So if you go to 128 clients, 
then the best possible number is for 64 clients per block. So what this, what this su suggests is that if you could statistically sample your input rate and dynamically adjust the frames per block, you could make sure that your uh, frames per block is about half. And you know, that, that's an interesting thing to try. Don't, it's not possible today, but it's something to think about. So just to reiterate what I just said, uh, we're looki not looking just at the throughput. We're also looking at CPU utilization and the number of times you fall back to poll. For UDP receive a message in tpacket v2, the CPU is kept 100% busy, and at steady state, you never fall back to poll. There's always something coming in. Um, with tpacket v3, uh, you are able to adjust this a bit more. We actually saw average polls per second to be about 13.7. And you know, what, what this says is if the client is not, cannot fill up your receive pipe, the server has better control over the batching this way. So what's happening right now? Right now I'm trying to take all of this and put it into the IPCLW library and finding out where the rubber hits the road. So one of the things is that um, now that I have to provide an entire frame, I have to supply the Ethernet header and the IP header. So that means I have to be correctly synced up with the kernel's control plane, with the current uh, fib and ARP state. So that means I have to keep track of a separate thread that uh, tracks all of this ch changes to state, and uh, that's extra work that needs to be done. Uh, I am also punting on the fragmentation and reassembly, but I can't do that forever. So when I run this in production, I might not be even able to set jumbo on the first half switch. So at that point, I really need to figure out where to do the IP frag and reassembly, either in user space or in the kernel. And um, this is where the uh, request for a UFO comes in. I'll give some numbers to uh, support that uh, request. So the other thing is UDP checksum. Right now, I'm cheating and not providing a UDP checksum. But I can't do that in production. I have to give a UDP checksum. And uh, I know that everybody likes to curse out SK buffs, but SK buffs are not all badness. The fact that there is an SK buff at the bottom end of PF packet is kind of nice, because I can offload um, checksum at that point, assuming that the packet is within the MTU. So when all of this is done, the next thing that I will do is to um, run this with our CR test bench benchmark. So what is CR test? It's a cluster atomic benchmark which simulates a typical RDBMS workload. And the reason I'll provide these details is just to show what kind of complexity is there in the back end and why this is not just network I.O. So the CR test test suite can switch between various types of transports. It can switch between uh, InfiniBand and RDMA. It can do UDP. It can do RDS TCP. Uh, what it does is it simulates a lock management server, which actually contacts a real Exadata database in the back end and warms up its, its buffer cache. We call these XCURR buffers. So what that means is a single database instance holds the lock from this buffer. And then a client comes in and asks for a, a block from that uh, instance's ownership. So you have to get a read-only copy and then ship it. This is the 8K packet that gets sent out. So all of this is uh, very CPU bound. So given that the backend stuff is CPU bound, given that the input is coming in as fast as possible, then CPU utilization is a bottleneck. We don't want to waste any more CPU cycles on anything that we don't have to. And especially fragmentation and reassembly, if my NIC can do it for me, uh, I can spend my CPU cycles doing other things. So this is where UFO comes in. So uh, another, some actual data to support that uh, UFO claim. So we ran the CR test test suite, and initially the objective was just to compare RDS TCP performance with UDP. The initial thing was just to make sure RDS TCP did not regress. So the CR test test suite can run this with different sets of clients for me. So it can do one, two, four, all the way up to 64. And for each value of n clients, what it will do is it will give me the throughput and latency both. So when we were running this test suite, uh, one of the things we thought is let's just try a poor man's UDP offload. Let's just put Jumbo in there and see how, what it does. The results were actually quite interesting. So there's a number of things with this graph. Uh, the x-axis shows the throughput in thousands of packets, per, thousands of blocks per second. Each block is 8K bytes. The y-axis gives you the latency in microseconds. Each data point in there is for a certain number of clients. So for example, uh, this is 64 clients. This is one, two, and so on. Uh, then the graphs themselves, this is block UDP. This is RDS TCP. 
RDSTP with uh, jumbo frames, and this is UDP with jumbo frames. So a lot of questions come up when you look at these graphs. What is this flat part, and what is this wall? So the flat part is that as you add more clients in, you have still not hit the server-side bottleneck. So what happens is with more clients, your latency is uh, staying the same, but your throughput is increasing. At some point, you've hit the server-side bottleneck. So that's when you hit the wall. So you add more clients, and your throughput stays the same, but your latency keeps increasing. So the next question is, why is the wall for, uh, we call this the wall, the, the vertical line. So why is the wall for RDS TCP to the right of uh, UDP? What happens with UDP is that we still have to do this guaranteed reliable order delivery and so on. And we do this with all this sequence numbers and acts and retransmits and all of that stuff in user space. So each client is doing a mini TCP congestion machine. Uh, but it's all doing it in user space, so it's vulnerable to scheduling delays. Uh, on the other hand, TCP is doing this in a much more efficient way as one uh, congestion machine in the kernel. So it's able to get much better uh, server latency than the UDP case. So then what happens when we go to Jumbo? So guys looked at this and they said, why is it that for Jumbo, you teach RDS TCP doesn't move as much to the right as UDP does? So what happens with UDP is you went from, for 64 clients, you went from a latency of about 2,700 microseconds to a latency of about 1,800 microseconds. And your wall went from like 23, 2,400, 24,000 blocks per second to about 34,000 blocks per second. So that was very impressive. So, uh, and then they had no changes to the application code, so they just loved it. So this is just what I just said. Um, so the question was, why is Jumbo being so making such a big difference for UDP but not TCP? So UDP protocol layer is mostly stateless. It just adds a simple header, and most of the heavy lifting is being done with fragmentation and reassembly. Right? When you do Jumbo, you're taking away that load, and so things get much faster. The server-side latency gets much better. Now, TCP already has TSO enabled, so it's already sending pretty large packets down to the driver. Um, at the same time, TCP, even with TSO, still has to do some, a lot of work to keep track of protocol state. So while RDS TCP does benefit from um, Jumbo frames, it's not as much. So the moral of the story is, given that we have so many UDP-based protocols coming up, so UFO would be really nice to have. No changes to application, and suddenly everything got so much better. Um, I'll come back to that in a bit, but some of the other lessons learned along the way. So one is system tuning has to be done with caution. Even though we, I complained initially about DPDK not doing, being fair to other network protocols, I'm also doing that when I do SDFM. That's not something that's going to fly in production. Um, when you actually run this in production, I cannot disable IOMMU. I cannot turn off Ethernet flow control. I cannot go and tweak Cisco tunables to favor some types of connected sockets versus others because there are a number of other services running on these machines. Some people are doing Rocky. Other people are doing different kinds of NFS. So tuning one cannot hurt the other. Uh, also, when you do this in production, things like TCP dump need to continue to be able to work because that's what we need to be able to do when we actually debug problems. Uh, the other takeaway from all of this was I need to do fragmentation and reassembly somewhere. And that is non-trivial. Obviously, uh, the kernel does it, and it struggles to do it, but it's, the power, it's, it's, it's been working on this for many years, so it probably does it in a smart way. So that is an issue that I have to deal with. Um, the other thing here is something that has been touched on before. Uh, the thing that Stephen said in the morning, can you do this without having to have the application bend over backwards, plus one to that? <laughs> So even with all of the zero copy and shared memory, I cannot really use that. This is a library which is using send message. So it's giving me a receive message, and it's giving me a buffer, and it thinks it owns the buffer. I now have, if I now go and tell them, well, you own the buffer, but then you have to turn on this bit and hand it back to the kernel, and sometimes it belongs to you, and sometimes it belongs to the kernel. That's a lot of changes in the library. The uh, closest thing that does that in IPCLW today is, as somebody pointed out, RDMA. So what I'm working on right now is trying to figure out what RDMA is doing with all of this memory regions and stuff, and trying to map the same things for the uh, standard Ethernet TCP IP path so that it does it for these PF packet sockets. But that seems to be where we are headed at this point. 
Now, on the other hand, when we shave off the B copy on the Rx side, which as I pointed out to John Fastenet, that's a good thing because that's doing things without asking me to change all of my uh, library APIs. So that's the sort of thing that is welcome, but you know. So what's happening now is, as I said, I'm working on converting the IPCLW libraries to use tpacket v2 and v3 in the best possible way. Uh, the short way, I have things working, but they are using a mem copy into user space buffer, so that doesn't really save me anything. Um, so I need to make it also leverage the um, shared memory part of it. What I would like to have is not, I need to deal with fragmentation and reassembly at some point, so I'm trying to get some uh, pushing, I'm trying to push for UFO. I understand that the problems with UFO are doing checksums of 60, 65K packets, but if, if I have a 65K packet, I have to do that in the stack today anyway. And I am willing to compromise and say, if you can give me uh, UFO and checksum offload for up to 9K packets, that's good enough for me so that I'll, I'll go and say I'll do it in software for the bigger packets. Um, the other pie in the sky thing is that if all of this works, uh, somebody suggested that it might be nice to have the same sort of shims for other socket types like RDS. So that's another thing down the road that we may want to pursue. So that's what I had. Any questions? Go ahead. So remembering back in my early, long ago, um, there was actually, in one of the first net comps, we discussed the problem that uh, NFS over UDP gets data corruption. And the reason is, is because the IP sequence numbers are short and gets recycled fairly fast, even on a one gig network, on a 10 gig network. I think it's like 10 seconds. So how do you keep Oracle from getting data corruption? Do you have some on large UDP packets if you're gonna start getting fragmentation? So, uh NFS runs over TCP now, but for UDP, No, it used to run over UDP, yeah. and then you could also run it over TCP. If you ran it over UDP, you got data corruption. Right. So we actually rely on the kernel UDP module and the kernel UDP checksums to make, take care of the checksums. And the thing is that you can get the IP checksum or UDP checksum that is not safe for data. Because you can, there are, there's too many cases where you can get data flips that get the same checksum. Yeah, but you also have the Ethernet checksum, right? No, but that doesn't cover a fragmented UDP packet. In other words, what you could have happen is you have a fra one fragmented UDP packet. You miss one IP segment of it. Yes. It's hanging around. And another one comes along that just happens to hit the same we haven't sequence seen this number, we haven't seen this and Maybe this is the checksum comes through clean, and you'll get data corruption. Yeah, we haven't seen this in practice. Okay, IBM, I think it was Rusty reported it. IBM had seen it. But the database also does its own uh, cross-checking of the payload itself. Okay. So. Um, what was the Linux version you used uh, to, for the comparison between UDP and packet? Because the 100% difference looks strange to me. Which one is this? Uh, when you compare UDP versus... Uh, the histogram? Uh, th this one? Yeah. Okay. That's... Do you remember what, what was the Linux version during your test? What was the what? I think I Linux think. version. The Linux this kernel is, version. Um, I was using some version of NetNex, I think 4.9 or something. Oh, because the number were completely changed in 4.11. Uh, it was pretty recent. It was 4.9 to 4.10, something in between. <laughs> no, the change w went in 4.11. Uh, that's, that's why I'm asking. Uh, I can find the exact... Uh, you shouldn't RC. have this uh, difference between UDP and T-Packet anymore, so... Okay. Was there a specific commit I should look for? All the commits are done by, by Paolo Abini from Red Hat. Okay. It was, okay, I can find you the exact RC and get back to you. Hi. Um, so I, 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 I really would like to discourage you from using T-Packet. It seems like a lot of duplication in your application and a lot of synchronization of state in the control plane. It sounds to me like you need, as you said, receive multiple message. And, but what you also, it sounds like to me that you don't have 
is you need a send multiple message that paces. Is that, is that a fair statement? Because you don't want to you don't want to have a burstiness on the send either. So the send, mul so the send multiple message goes back to what I said about TX side batching. Because this is a request response, uh, it's kind of risky to do send multiple message because you're going to wake up a batch of clients. Right. So if you had a paste version of that, where you could say, I don't want to spam the network. I want you to send these, but 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 I want you to put some delay between each one. That would that would satisfy your need, I think. Actually, I, I'm not sure. I think that one of the big things, one of the big benefits of PF packet is the shared memory. And that is why my IPCLW conversion is not seeing any big improvements over UDP at this point. Okay. So I think so, that so, so, so saving the system call is part of it. So doing the shared memory is a big part of it. The, the shared memory is probably the big a big part, part yeah. of it. So, so then, but then you have to do all this work, um, particularly in the headers and all that other stuff that you need to take care of. So yes. you need something in between. And um, I know we don't have anything. What, what, I, what I wanted to really understand was when you set, if I understood you right, when you said when you set your, your wake up threshold with, I guess it didn't matter whether it was T packet or receive multiple message, uh, to, 60, uh, to 16, you said, you were always at that, that slide, yeah. It was always, it was always, there was always data. So presumably you woke up, processed 16, sent some packets out, the clients received their responses and so produced more, more, more data. Yes. That's what you said, because they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't send you date continuously. They, they just wait for the response and send more. Yes. Okay. And then at 32, it was a balance, but I noticed in your numbers. So now I'm actually really surprised. So you go from from zero percent utilization to thirty five percent free idle, yeah. uh, for idle, yeah. Um, but your your packet per second only goes down. It didn't calculate the percentages, exactly. but it looks like it looks like it's about ten percent, something like that, right? Um, Forty thousand on four hundred thousand packets, right? Right. So that seems really surprising to me, because it seems to me that that there must be a point in between sixteen and thirty two where you are in fact, you, you, like you've just hit a wall, clearly you've hit a wall, so there must be a point a little bit further back where your, your, your CPU idle is still significant, so the but your number is still almost 41, so, so 44,000. The reason we cannot go between 16 and 32 because these go in powers of two. So right, so, so you just can't, can't, you just can't tweak that point, number. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's the, 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 the you, could, you could, I don't know. You could insert a 16 and then an E yeah, or I something can, like okay. that, right? Maybe, but okay. So I just wanted to say it's very surprising. But but the the point is that your your system clearly can offer a higher load, and you could process more packets. But you don't want to do that because I guess I understand what you're saying is that you want to you're trying not to kill yourselves processing them, but that in fact there is in fact additional load, and you're just you're just not accepting it. Yeah, but that's because I know that in practice, first of all, my client is not going to be able to fill up the input pipe. I know that. And I was trying to simulate that with the bench micro benchmark, right? Um, the other thing is that if I can still process a pretty good throughput and, and keep the CPU and keep the CPU idle for other applications, that is interesting to me because it's not just the back end. There might be other services running on this machine which want the CPU utilization. And but how much of that was because when you process 64 or 32 at a time that you then caught, woke up that many clients, which then killed you again? So, I mean, if you had an output, at a send rate pacing, would you be able to do something different? Because um, it sounds to me like that's what you're really experiencing, is you're causing a, a, a stampeding, a herd. Every time you send some, every time you wake up and you process some traffic at 64, then you wake up 64 clients who then send you lots of data again. Right? I'm not sure it's the herd though, right? I mean, uh, yes, this is kind of a, an artificial thing because I have 64 clients and there is, there, there is a bottleneck there. But even if I had more clients, I think that being able to balance things is a valuable thing. But, but at this point, you're not pacing your output even with, with T-Packet. You're not doing any kind of output pacing. You're just letting the, the driver take care of it. Pretty much, yeah. With T-Packet, you can just let the, dri the, the driver take it. With, with send multiple, you would have to do the system call and change your own, pick your own time to, to send. Correct. Right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. No more questions, please. Uh, we'll, we'll put up in the penalty box if you want to talk to her. But let's give a round of applause, please.